It's midday. Good afternoon and welcome to News Today on Joy News here on Multi TV. My name is Kwabna Chencha Inibwati. Coming up, these are energy expert Dr. Charles Reku Brobe questions the basis of a 2% tariff increment amid poor utility service. Organized labor charges government to be proactive in fixing the power crisis. Hunted, mocked, and abused, the sad story of albinos who are being pursued for rituals. For the details of these and more, stay with us over the next hour. Welcome to Join News Today. Thank you for joining us. In our very first story, Dr. Charles Rekubrobe has questioned the decision of the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, the PURC, to increase utility tariffs by 2%. The energy expert, speaking at a forum organized by the TUC, outlined steps of fixing the country's energy crisis. There's institutional problems with the energy sector. When I first came here, most of our projects were funded by international agencies. And transparency was the key word. Every project was advertised in The Economist, Newsweek, The Financial Times, etc. VRA plan for new generation addition. Starting somewhere in 2006, ECG has been turned into a vehicle for PPAs. And that is contributing to part of this problem. We have set up Gridco. Gridco is doing nothing more than what he used to do when it was the transmission department of VRA. But Greco can do more. It can be a system operator. It can be the independent arbiter. It can buy power. It can sell power and ensure that transparency and competitiveness is uh, what will give us sustained power and cheaper power. And so what are the benefits for labor? If we put on your Ajit prop hat, and get involved now, you can stop the current job losses from layoffs and shutdown. And that means that the, your theme, and I hope you tell the president when you meet him, end power crisis now, not soon. Not worry about whether my friend Kovinad Onko will keep his job or not, but you want it now. Tell him that I have told you we have a homegrown solution, proper one or not the IMF type. And that, that homegrown solution requires injection of small cash to make it happen. Because if we don't end the crisis by the end of this year, God save Ghana. We shall all be finished. Because not, how many of you know that Unilever does not produce in Ghana anymore? How many of you know that PZ does not produce in Ghana anymore? How many factories have been shut down because of the problems of the recurring do so, do so? It's in the collective interest of organized labor that the industry and manufacturing of Ghana is revived, expanded. We can compete, we can sustain, we can make sure that we have quality products. Start off with asking government the biggest purchasing power in this country to turn its urges of buy made in Ghana into buying made in Ghana. The reason I make the city falling is that Samuel is doing something we should do. Fearing there may be a lot more job cuts in the country as a result of the current energy crisis, organized labor has charged government to be a lot more proactive in addressing the number one problem plaguing industry and Ghanaians in general. It's estimated that about a thousand workers have so far been laid off in the last few months as a result of the crisis, with other companies threatening to part ways with a lot more of the staff. Addressing a forum ahead of May Day, Trades Union Congress Secretary General Kofi Asamoah says Ghanaians have had to wait too long for the problem to be fixed. 
Forum comes even as reports indicate government is highly unlikely to fulfill its promise to bring in power badges at the end of April as a short-term measure to ease the crisis. The TUC Secretary General at the Forum to usher in the 2015 National May Day celebration said, there are indications more jobs are on the line as a result of the prolonged crisis. He said government has to talk less and fix the problem. The former chief executive of the Volta River Authority, Dr. Charles Reku Brobe, highlighted the indebtedness of the Electricity Company of Ghana to his former workplace, a debt he believes is a major reason why the country finds itself in the crisis. He there should be more concern about the cash flow problems that the sector faces if we are interested in stopping doing so, do so at the shortest possible time, ECG owes VRA several billion cities. And because ECG owes VRA, VRA is unable to pay for the gas. And ECG owes Asogli because Asogli had to sign a PPA with ECG before all of this started before 2006 or 2007, VRA was responsible for generation in Ghana full stop. Now ECG who we are wanting to protect as a strategic asset, I don't know whether it's a distribution company or it's not a generation company. They also warn the situation could get worse if government does not settle what it owes Nigeria for gas supplied for electricity generation. Despite the fact that people won't tell you the truth or communicate with you at all. I know it for a fact, you know, and it could be pillow talk for all you know, that the Nigerians have written to Ghana to threaten to cut off the gas. It's no longer, you know, and in fact, when they had a problem a few weeks ago, which had nothing to do with a threat, it just happened to coincide with a threat, the whole government system was panicking. Have we paid, or have we made an agreement to pay the 120 million? If the Nigeria gas goes, it means that Asogli, which is the bedrock of our thermal generation, will also go. All the thermal plants which are running on gas will also go. So it will be 12 hours, 24. It will be 6 hours, 30. The chief policy analyst of the Ghana Institute for Public Policy Options also admonished government to inject cash into the energy sector to save the situation from getting worse. General Secretary of the Agricultural Workers Union, Edward Career, is cautioning employers to keep to the labor laws of Ghana and not use the current power crisis as a pretext to abusing them. Speaking on Business Life, Edward Career cautions business owners to set out clear parameters in the, in the equal awarding of employees if productivity must be achieved. The strong weaknesses of uh, our economy, and particularly the workplace, is that there are no uh, sufficient and effective uh, measures to measure productivity and then to link that one to uh, reward. Uh, one in many workplaces, there's no clock in systems, and then there's no even uh, targets for workers to be able to achieve. And even if the, where there are targets, how are those targets de uh, determined? How scientific are they? Uh, how are they related? Now, again, you also look at numbers at a workplace. The number of workers vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the work that is being done, the size of the organization. How is the size of an organization being determined? Is it being determined by the number of workers they have or by its uh, profitability uh, level or by what or level of production or what? All those things are not properly put in place and therefore you would have an, an imbalance uh, so far as productivity, workplace structures and the remuneration of workers is concerned. Our businesses putting workers at the center of their businesses. To what extent do they treat them? So if you look at a conditions of service of a worker, you have to divide it into three. One has to do with wages, the other one has to do with other conditions of service, and the third one has to do with the dignity, the, the, the treatment 
relations within the workplace? How do they relate with workers? Do they treat them as human beings? Do they make them to participate in decisions that are critical to uh, them? You know, those things at many workplaces are not there. Pressure Group Occupy Ghana has asked the government to scrap any plans to lay off public sector workers as part of conditions set out by the International Monetary Fund in its bailout program. Government, as part of its obligations under the agreement, is expected to rationalize the public sector and reduce the wage bill. But addressing the media in Accra, a leading member of the group, Sidney Casley Hayford, suggested laying off workers is not the only way to reduce the wage bill. Occupy Ghana is meanwhile asking workers to join them to protest the country's economic hardships by wearing red on Friday, May 1. Occupy Ghana cited several lapses in the management of the country's finances, including poor management of pension funds, increase in fuel prices, and most importantly, the energy crisis, which has compelled several companies to lay off workers. It warns there are likely to be further job cuts with government IMF deal. We think that one of the biggest areas of drain in this economy are the ghost workers who are sitting on the payroll. It would be better that government should clean that payroll, sanitize the payroll, and then if it needs additional people, it can then rethink whether or not the number of staff it has in its civil service and public service is inadequate to deliver the results of what it's expecting to achieve. It doesn't necessarily have to be layoffs. It doesn't necessarily have to be a freeze on recruitment. There are many, many pockets that government could use to actually cut back on the waste, cut back on the corruption, increase the revenue, so it need not let people suffer in these dark times. The group wants all workers to use May Day to signal to government their frustration with the current economic situation. We are asking that the significance of May Day on this particular May Day should be shifted. Let it become a voice of protest and a voice of complaint to the government. Let them understand clearly that as much as we are not going to walk the streets attempting to destroy anything and create mayhem, we are at least going to register our protests by making sure that we symbolize the day with something red. A red shoe, a red scarf, a red pair of earrings, a red pair of socks, anything that we can think of that will enhance that day. The group argues the action signifies people's desire for better governance. Hunted, mocked and abused, the story of 33-year-old Wahab who was uh, prosecuted, be persecuted of, uh, because of his condition as an albino. Wahab escaped death three times. Wahab's ordeal highlights the dangers persons with albinism face. Wahab's story was featured in the first part of our hotline documentary on the Super Morning Show. But I was hearing them saying that, oh, we thank God this year the harvesting will be very plentiful. This year we will have a lot of harvesting. Anytime we have an albino to sacrifice to the gods, we get a lot of, uh, uh, we get a lot of harvest that year. And uh, thank God we have had one. And this one is uh, very energetic, very healthy. So they were saying so, and I got to realize, I don't know, something was going on. Mm. So I was really scared. I was very scared then. So now you, you, here you are going to find some work to get money to support yourself through school. Then you get to know that the people you are trying to work for, want, they want to use you for sacrifice. What ran through your mind that night, knowing that you are going to be delivered for crucifixion just like Christ was? Yeah, um, very interesting. Uh, once you have brought the issue of Christ, you know, that then I was, uh, I had just converted from Christianity to Islam duo. I sat down in the night and prayed, and I said only one thing to God. I said, God, I know you created me, and if it is your will that I should be used to be sacrificed to your enemy, then so shall it be. But if your power is greater than even your enemy, I don't think if I'm not deserved that you save me from this. Some of them will always like to insult me, tell me a lot of things that will make me uncomfortable. And you know, I was not able to see far from the board. 
So I have to get closer. And whenever I move closer to the board, people were always complaining I had blocked their views and whatever. Then because of that, they will be insulting me here and there. Sometimes I have to be violent. So I have to fight some of them to be able to have my way through. And I continue with that till I completed GSS. Interesting. So at times, what were some of the things they say to you? Some call me monkey. Others also say I am an evil. Some say I'm a smaller god. Some even get to the extent of referring me to a pig. What was your father's reason for not taking you to school? Uh, he has heard from people that persons living with albinism do not live longer and uh, that we can't also see. So when we are sent to school, we will not be able to perform academically. And even when it gets to a point we have to be enjoying from our suffering for the knowledge, and we will just be dying. Well, my colleague Felix Akoyam is the person in charge of this. He's been doing this documentary. He joins me in the studio now with more on this. So, uh, Felix, uh, what more are we to expect in this documentary? We've heard a touching story there, but what more are we to expect? I'm sure, Kabna, you, you may have heard of lots of myths about albinos. Mm, and indeed. for instance, there's this myth that albinos do not die. They vanish into thin air. There's also this perception that they do not attend to nature's call on Fridays. Wow. Some believe that albinos do not sleep in the night. And so because of all these misconceptions, when an albino is born into a town for the first time, um, it, it puts that person in a, in a big challenge because mm -hmm. the people, I mean, feel that this person does not belong here yeah. or that person is a curse. And so as a result of that, some try to end the life of these albinos and most of them have been sharing, sharing very harrowing experiences with me in this documentary. And so we're going to highlight the dangers, I mean, they go through just because of their medical condition. And quite apart from that, they also face a lot of discrimination in mm. terms of getting jobs, even in marriages, relationships. It's very, very disturbing. I see. You also uh, spoke of uh, they being hunted. H how bad is that situation? That's very serious. And we is it just for saw rituals or for? For rituals, hmm. just, we just saw Wahab. And Wahab, you know, was born in a town called Sapala in the northern region. And he was the first albino to be born in that town. Hmm. Right from birth, he was hunted, hunted. And moving on from there, when he went to senior high school, the same thing happened. I mean, threats on his life. Yeah. He tried struggling to get a job on a farm The people felt he was good for sacrifice. And I mean, he said it himself that the people felt he, I mean, if they use him for the sacrifice, their harvest will be bountiful. Mm. And that's a general perception, I mean, some people have. Quite apart from that, we also have the story of Newton. Okay. Newton, who went for a funeral at Akwemufie, and Newton was inhibited from attending this funeral there because he was told that um, albinos are not accepted in that town. And so he had to remain in the ve vehicle they traveled in until the funeral Until the ended. funeral was over. Until the funeral was over. And, but this, I mean, the traditional rulers at Akumufi are denying. They are saying that this was something that happened in the past. But Newton also tells us that indeed it happened in 2010. He published it in the first newsletter of um, the Ghana Association of Persons with Albinism and also made a complaint to the Ghana Federation of the Disabled. So very harrowing stories, chilling stories they are sharing with us. Mm. And we are going to highlight that in the I coming see. months. I see. OK, so when are we to get the, the second part on radio? The second part on radio should be ready next week. OK, all right. right. Thank you very much, Felix Akoyam. And uh, you can be sure there will be a version for TV pretty shortly. Just keep your tabs right here on Joy News Multi TV. Now, the national chairman of the Ghana Coalition on NGOs in Health, Bill Benaku, says the current crisis facing the National Health Insurance Scheme is due to leadership failure. Speaking on the AM show, Benaku said, Mr. Benaku said, uh, lack of priorities by the current leadership of the NHIA is responsible for the non-payment of claims to service providers. Various healthcare providers and organizations have threatened to withdraw services to NHIS cardholders over unpaid claims running into over 500 million Ghana cities. The National Health Insurance have leadership crisis. And I'll continue to say it 
for the president to hear, if he is not hearing, we will continue to say it. Even during the 2016 campaign, we will continue to say How do we cure that? The 201 that? that we are operational. This is, this tells you that we are not making it because, one, the ability to pay the service provider is not proactive. Two, the service universal access to health in Ghana is receiving attention and therefore you are going to have more people to enroll into the national health insurance because the, uh, the, the system has been seen sustained for all this year. Mm. So we need to, 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 to respond to that. Meanwhile, the Ghana Coalition on NGOs in Health say it is contemplating court action against the National Health Insurance Authority. It's about time that somebody really took the NHIA on as in sue them. Yes. Because they've been turned away by a certain facility yes. who had insisted yes. that pay cash. Yes. It will come. <laughs> it will when? come very soon. It will come very soon. And you are going to hear from us. Do you, do you yeah. know of certain people who are trying to take an action yes, like I'm that? Yes, I'm very much aware. It will come very soon across the 10 regions. We, we only need to have data. And once we get the data, you are going to see the other side of Ghanaians. We will not allow our leaders to just override us. Now, Cabinet has approved a concession arrangement that will see the private sector support the electricity company of Ghana to make it more efficient in the delivery of power. The move, according to Deputy Power Minister John Jinapo, is to enable the private sector inject capital into the operations of the state power distributor. Mr. Jinapo said this on the sidelines of a program on business and procurement opportunities under the Millennium Development Compact 2 in Parliament. Elton John Bobe is currently in Parliament and joins us over the telephone with more on this. So, uh, Elton, this statement by the Deputy Minister, what, what does it mean? Well, what, 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 it mean, what it means is that mm. there's going to be some uh, private sector participation uh, in the power sector. Uh, but he also mentioned that uh, this is not to say that government is privatizing the electricity company of Ghana, which has been in the news for a while now. But rather, government wants to encourage the private sector to invest money into power generation especially because according to him government is keen and has already initiated actions towards reform to attract more private sector participation in the energy and power sector and these include according to the minister a transparent framework of development and management of natural resources movement towards a lead cost transparent process of competitive bidding for power generation and also the allocation and pricing of legacy hydropower the greater resource and resilience planning among the generation. Now, now what, what, he, what, what he said was that uh, the private sector, they have their money, so they are bringing in their money, they're also bringing in manpower. Mm. They want to improve uh, on the efficiency of the electricity campaign of Ghana, especially, so that they can live up to their money. And this decision, according to him, was taken by cabinet today. So going forward, we are, we are likely to see private sector participation in the energy generation and delivery sector. Mm. But it was quick to add that this is not to say that government is privatizing the electricity company of Ghana. I see. But did the Deputy Minister uh, give any timelines to this? Well, he says cabinet, uh, cabinet gave the approval uh, this morning, mm. uh, which means that going forward, government is going to invite uh, the private sector to pay. There was also another issue about the, the, the percentage within which the private sector will be allowed to play in the power sector. Now, I got information, a source told me that government is looking between 40 and 50 percent. So that discussion is still ongoing, but the, the, the definite statement government has made so far is that it will now accept private sector participation in the power generation sector. And this, according to him, is to ensure efficient delivery of power in the country. I see. Also in Parliament, Elton, we are told the Attorney General Marietta Brewer Pierpong uh, is before the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, what has transpired so far? Well, uh, she just left. I mean, she spent uh, about 20 minutes uh, mm. because uh, the, the, there weren't much issues for her to address. Okay. Uh, the only issue that came up was that the Yoko, after collection of using money acquired illegally by some individuals and some companies, instead of lodging it into the consolidated fund, they rather 
for logistics that exhibit accounts. Now, the explanation that Yoko boss and the, uh, the Attorney General offered before the Public Accounts Committee is that once they go into the seizure of money, they, they, they always use the exhibit of account. They always lodge uh, that money into their exhibit account instead of the consolidated account. account. Now, once they are finished with their investigation, and they have ample grounds to prosecute that individual, they will use that evidence. But if they don't have any evidence to prosecute such individuals, such monies are released to those individuals. Now, key issue that came up was why, uh, it, I mean, this, 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 there's this issue in the public domain that the Public Accounts Committee has become a name and shame committee instead of, you know, prosecuting people they recommend uh, after the Auditor General has audited, you know, the accounts of public institutions. Now, the Attorney General told Parliament that uh, she's heard of all the concerns being raised by the general public. Now, going forward, she formed a committee made up of Yoko, the police, the Public Accounts Committee, and her office. Once the Auditor General finished with it, uh, auditing and Parliament accounts, the Public Accounts Committee goes into the hearing and makes recommendations to Parliament. She will take it out from there and prosecute individuals cited in the Auditor General's report for, you know, for misappropriating public funds. So going forward, now we are likely to see action or recommendations that the Public Accounts Committee usually come up with after their public hearing. So we are likely to see prosecution of people, uh, individuals who are always cited in the Auditor General's report. I see. And uh, how soon is this to begin? Well, she said that uh, she's come up with this committee, so uh, it is now up to uh, the Public Accounts Committee, the other uh, other bodies, that the, the police and the Yoko, to now work together and come up with a, with a framework. Because uh, what is going to happen is that there's already a backlog of reports available before Parliament that is awaiting action on the part of the other side general to prosecute individuals cited in those reports. So we are looking at about 20 reports already pending. Mm -hmm. And this one, they are, they, they, they are conducting public hearings into it. Once they are done with it, they will present their report to the plenary. Parliament, as a body, will make a, a, a solution. And it will go to add up to the, the, the 20 reports that are already pending. So we are looking at, you know, quite a long haul of issues the committee will have to look into it before formal prosecution starts. Okay, Elton, thank you very much for that update. Elton John Dobe is our parliamentary correspondent. Now, Port Health officials say they are battling to monitor unapproved routes. The issue of unapproved entry points at Ghana's border town of, of Paga in the Upper East region has become a major challenge for Port Health officials in their efforts to prevent the entry of beds into Ghana following the outbreak of bed flu in Burkina Faso. Speaking to Joy News Upper East Regional Correspondent Albert Sorry says, says the officer in charge of the, the Port Health Unit at the Ghana Burkina Faso border at well we'll bring you back that story we're taking a break here we'll be back shortly port health officials say they are battling to monitor unapproved routes the issue of unapproved entry points at ghana's border town of paga in the upper east region has become a major challenge for port health officials in their efforts to prevent the entry of beds into Ghana following the outbreak of bed flu in Burkina Faso. Speaking to Joy News Upper East Regional Correspondent Albert Sorry, officer in charge of the Port Health Unit at the Ghana Burkina Faso border at Paga, Francis Nyameche, said they've intensified security at the border and destroyed some beds that were being brought into the country, but the unapproved routes still make the country a little vulnerable. It draw the attention of the vet man to see how best he can educate them and how best he can use his pulse to test whether they are having the bear flu or not. So these are the measures we have been taking here. So normally, when even it comes and we see that in our pulse, we cannot do much, we draw his attention to take action. And since the outbreak of this bed flu, would you say that the number of people who bring in beds from Burkina Faso has reduced or has it stopped at all? Uh, it has reduced, actually it has reduced. The number of travelers coming in with beds have reduced. The National Union of Ghana Students, NUCS, is demanding government publishes a document stating its official position on the suggestion that students should pay utility fees. Paul Olanyo, coordinating secretary of the National Union of Ghana Students, joins us in studio with more now. So uh, your concern is that you want government to come out strong and say 
we are not charging students. Is that the case? Uh, no, the ultimate concern of mm. the, the, the union is for government to be firm in telling us that it is not going to charge. We, we just don't want to see that component of the fees on the bills of the students. That is our main and ultimate concern from NUCS. Now, uh, this is the cost sharing option government is proposing. NUCS obviously was part of this meeting and you did agree to it. Why then do you turn around and say you are no longer interested in this and in fact you are actually going to resist it? Well, thank you very much. Let me put this on record that uh, you saying that we did agree to this decision is factually inaccurate. I was part of the stakeholders dialogue at UPSA mm -hmm. where several um, stakeholders came in to come up with suggestions. Let me just take you down the, the, the whole scenario. We, we, we had Vice Chancellor Ghana's representatives, ECG, we have Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Education, student bodies, as well as some other major stakeholders. Now, the bin of p payment of utilities, you know, vice chancellors are constantly harassed by the ECG for non-payment. So ECG knows that for them to be in a safer position, students should pay, and that will give them the comfort. And VC Ghana also knows that government's failure to constantly pay, uh, becoming a thorn in their flesh, mm. if students are pushed to pay, it means that they will also be safe. So <clears throat> the ultimate uh, uh, bearers will be the students. And we, at that point, told them, it was crystal clear, we made our point known that we're not going to allow such payment. Yes, of course, the majority of the people came out with that decision that students in the residential facilities pay the bills, whilst government pay for um, faculties, I mean the lecture theaters and the libraries. But we, we think that the best thing to do at this point in time is to gradually, uh, as it may, try to maybe reduce cost not to rather even exacerbate the situation. Okay. So that is our challenge. Let, let's, yeah. let's take a listen to Deputy Minister of Education, Samuel Okujito Ablakwa. Government has not taken a decision to impose a cost sharing arrangement on utilities as at now, as was proposed at UPSA on the 25th of March. Cabinet is yet to consider the UPSA declaration. So there is no basis for agitation at this point. It is important and healthy for there to be a national debate on the UPSA declaration and for positions to be put out. But it is important that at this point in time, there has to be calm, there shouldn't be threats, there's no need for agitation, there's no need for demonstration because no final decision has been taken as at yet. And as my minister said, when government takes a decision, government will formally and officially communicate to the institutions. So this is what the Deputy Minister is saying. Are you not okay with this? Not at all. Not mm. at all. We are not satisfied with just uh, talk. Okay, I, just want, I also want to put on record that there is nothing like UPSA declaration. It becomes a formality or it becomes a declaration when it is put in the public domain. Nothing of that sort has been put into the public domain. So there is nothing like UPSA declaration. Well, the Deputy Minister of Education has stated his point clear that government is yet to. Very well, we, we appreciate that government is yet to. Mm. So there's so, no cause for complaint? There basically. is, there is. There is. Um, the, the ancient people say um, the development of a henia is seen in the size of the testicles. Mm. From what we are seeing now, the indicators are clear. Government is yet to. Tell you that government may. We just don't want government to. Uh, so yesterday we, we've, we've asked mm. them to provide us document stating that government has not made any of such uh, uh, propo uh, uh, proposals. So, so in the course of time, we are going to demand document from the ministry stating categorically that government has not made such arrangement for charging of utilities. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. But uh, just, just on record, the UPSA declaration is already in the public domain. But, of, uh, unofficially, anyway. it is, but it, not it is, officially. It is, actually. But thank you very much for your time. And, thank uh, you that was a representative of the National Union of Ghana students here. Now, Ghana could well be described as China's biggest trading partner in Africa. Trade between the two countries increased to a record 
billion US dollars in 2014, while exports from Ghana to China also rose to over 1.4 billion. This was disclosed by China's ambassador to Ghana, Sun Bao Hong, when she commissioned an ICT laboratory for pupils of the Dong Junior High School, from where Rafiq Salam sends this report. The Ultramodern ICT Laboratory was constructed through the joint efforts of the China-Africa People-to-People Friendly Action and the Ghana-China Friendship Association with support from the Chinese Embassy. The 165,000 Ghana cities facility has 31 desktop computers and an internet connection. It will serve pupils of the Duan Junior High School and other schools in the Nadoli Kalio district. Even though pupils of the Duan GHS study ICT as a subject, most of them have never seen in real life computer, apart from the drawings they have seen. Commissioning the facility, the Chinese ambassador stated, the successful completion of the project is indicative of the ever deepening relationship between China and Ghana and Africa at large. She noted that trade between China and Ghana hit $5.6 billion in 2014, adding that China has ruled out various initiatives to facilitate Ghana's export to China. Touching on the agriculture and other potentials of the Upper West region, the Chinese ambassador said she would encourage Chinese entrepreneurs to invest in the region. The Upper West region has a great potential in agriculture and a huge infrastructure deficit as well. I will encourage more Chinese enterprises to reach out to this region cooperate with local departments and agencies such as SADA, promote the development of agriculture and the agro-processing sector, invest more to the infrastructure development, fully tap the potential of the region and promote the overall development of savannah areas of Ghana, supporting the ambition of His Excellency President Mahama to transform the savannah areas into an economic zone. Deputy Upper West Regional Minister Dr. Mushebu Mohamed Alpha bemoaned the lack of ICT resources in the region, which deprives it of the opportunity to benefit from the world of technology. To further bridge the information gap between urban and rural areas in Ghana, the Ministry of Communication has established community information centers in rural communities in the region, but more, of course, need to be done. On behalf of the chiefs and people of the Upper West region, I would like to thank the Chinese government for the establishment of this ICT center in Bro. This clearly will go a long way to rejuvenate the interests of students in the study of ICT in schools and also improve the performance of students in ICT during examinations. The Chinese ambassador visited the Duan Bone Setting Center and later donated food items with 5,000 Ghana cities to the people of Pazie. Rafiq Salam's report for Joy News. Afternoon, Ghana, and welcome to the Midday Sports, proudly brought to you by Mixi Milk Powder. Now, the first Capital Plus Premier League may have uh, come to an end uh, with regards to the first round. A camera squad at Accra Sports Stadium yesterday when Accra Great Olympics played new DBS Football Club. We caught up with defender Dan Quay on what he makes of the game. It's a penalty, but I think it's one of those things in football, so I will keep it cool. Maybe next time I will correct my mistake. Now, with, uh, with the experience when, when we joined the team, I think, me like particularly, like, this is my third, uh, third match, my, my league third match. So I think we do now the first runners in, and we have 18 points. It's good. So second round, we have to prepare well so that we focus and win about seven or ten matches so that we'll be among the top four. And one player who has had a massive impression on the performance of a car grade Olympics is uh, Gordon Ashram. We spoke to him on what he makes of the quality in the Premier League. The thing about the league is that uh, uh, since we joined, uh, it has been uh, one way or the other. Olympics were down and uh, we're trying to, to, to bring the team back to, to position, not to go to the relegation. Uh, the league itself uh, is very strong league. Uh, 
Believe me, the boys are really working very, very hard. The only thing uh, we all need is all about the organization more uh, to, to let the league grow. Um, it hasn't been bad at all. It has been uh, a very uh, high level since we joined because uh, all the clubs right now playing against Olympics, they try to work very, they want to fight, they want to play against Olele, they want to play against Godwin, they want to tackle and all these kind of things. So for me, I think uh, coming back to the league, I've been uh, uh, good old man for Ghana football and for me as well. New DBRC Football Club have had a very difficult start to the first quarter plus Premier League thus season. Club uh, CEO Alex Akume is already looking forward to the second round. Uh, my team have not done well, and because uh, we are lying at a danger zone, and I believe that lying there will keep you always on the toes. You won't get a rest unless you survive from that place. And the league has said, oh, it's been good, it's been tough. Uh, because uh, uh, the teams have been going to other teams' home to play draw and win away matches, and I believe that too that uh, uh, the last three matches have been very cagey because of the attraction of these good players that have been have, have been in the league so far. Tram and Co. They have done well. We play against them today. I saw the experience. Though only really believe that no one have We break this record today. We scored two goals. And I believe that uh, we, 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 we will start from Olympics as a full Kotoko Dubiase, that game, lift up to expectation. And I believe that we are going to rest, break. The PLB, I remember the PLB, we have, we have put up uh, two, some programs. We will meet the media officers of the clubs and uh, on the seminar to educate them about how to give uh, publicity to the, the clubs, supporters who attend. We wrap up the midday sports with um, Royal 2016 qualifiers. The Black Meteors are in uh, action as they look to qualify for the Rio 2016 Olympic Games after missing out on London 2012. Management Committee um, member Abdul Salam Yakubu has been speaking to Joy News about the preparations being made so far. Uh, the team is fine, and, and um, we'll play our first game last week. Uh, for that's the Olympics came qualify. We play last week, we won by two goes to nil, and then we play without the professionals. We play with only one professional, that's a Enoke Bando, formerly King Faisal. But um, the next game, we are playing with uh, only local players, so the team is fine, and then everything is fine, everything is okay. So, just yes, we need the players from all the Ghanaians, and then we need support. Tamale, the media and the supporters, they don't come in Tamale. Always, at, apart from the blaster, we don't see the media and the supporters. So, for this Saturday, there is no leak anywhere. So, we need the supporters, we need everybody to come and support um, the, the Metro's team. This is uh, our first qualifier. When we win this, when we qualify, then we, we plan for the Congo DR. That's it for the Midday Sport. Now, that a pregnant woman who deliver at home is not exactly news as it happens a lot of the time. But the case of 25 year old resident of Kufuridia Zongo in the Eastern region is, however, odd because she delivered at the entrance to her house, having been turned away from the hospital. The midwife at the Kufuridia Zongo Health Center is said to have refused to deliver the expectant mother. Uh, Bushira Safianu simply because she had not shaved her pubic hair. He reports by Haruna Yusif Wumpini. One will be sleeping here, one is sleeping somewhere. So, as for me, if Esther Mesa is removed from Zungu to another place, I'll be happy. Aside to that one too, a mosquito net was brought to the Zungu community last year. And this Esther Mesa distributed the net without consulting the community health committee or any assembly member. She didn't involve any assembly member and she didn't involve community health committee members. She did it on her own. 
Having done that, she paid the volunteers according to her conscience. She gave some 50 Ghana cities and some 100 Ghana cities. Why should that be so? So I am appealing to... Meanwhile, a senior midwife at the Adabaka Polyclinic here in Accra, Hajia Damata Suleimana, has been explaining what goes into shaving women before delivery. We are trying to ensure that we improve upon maternal health care, improve upon our maternal practices, and that pregnant women have access to skill delivery and deliver safely. The case has just been brought up to our notice. So I have immediately, as soon as I heard it, I immediately set up a committee to investigate the case to go into the allegations and really investigate. And they have up to the close of today to submit their findings. And based on their findings, we will then be able to speak into the matter. Well, that was rather the voice of director of the Eastern Regional Office, uh, uh, Dr. Charity Sapon, I must say. Well, that'll be it for the hour. A quick recap of our top stories on Joy News today. Energy expert Dr. Charles Rekubrobe questions the basis of a 2% tariff increment amid poor utility service. Organized labor charges governments to be proactive in fixing the country's power crisis. And hunted, mocked, and abused the sad story of albinos who are being pursued for rituals. Now, be it this hour for more news. Do well to log on to myjournline.com. My name is Kwabna Chenchenibwazi. Have a good afternoon.